Good morning. Bienvenido. Welcome to the second day of the 2022 Zero Project Conference for Latin America and the Spanish-speaking community. I am Andrés Verogi, and I'm the head of management and diversity of Fundación Descúbreme. I'm a white man, tall, and I'm wearing glasses, and I'm 53 years old. Good morning or good afternoon. I am Maria Ignacia Rodriguez. I am a white woman, average height, dark hair, and I'm also wearing glasses. In Fundación Descubreme, my role is the International Coordination Chief and also the Coordinator of Zero Project for Latin America. This project, we have the great uh, task of expanding its mission for a world without barriers for uh, the Spanish-speaking world and our region. We want to thank the moderation of Carolina Garcia, the vision of experts such as Axel Leblois, President Dan, Executive Director of G3 ICT and Laura Allen, the Head of Strategy of Accessibility in Google for their presentations in the session Technology at the Service of Accessibility. Given the incredible importance of technology as a tool for promoting independence of people with disabilities, as it is seen in the great session that we just heard, we're going to continue talking about the topic, this topic in our next session, which is cutting edge technologies for inclusion. This panel shows how the use of these new cutting edge technologies may simplify the life of people with disabilities through the creation of tools, devices, assistive technologies, apps, and many other uses. The moderator of this session that is going to be with us for the third year because of its great knowledge in this to based, uh, on this topic, it's Ricardo Bahamonde, who is the leader of accessibility and in digital inclusion in Atos, Iberia. Also with us, we have great speakers, Pablo Escobar from Sedeti UC, a research center of the Catholic University of Chile that have created a digital system for, the, for promoting the reading through games for children with disability, especially for Down syndrome children. Also with us, we have Claudio Neverens from Univo Drive, a German organization that have created a technology based on smart glasses that allow them to move the wheelchair with the movement of their head. And also with us is Carlo Castellano from the Association of People with Reduced Mobility in Spain, who created part for this app that allowed them to uh, find these uh, park spaces for people with disabilities. We invite you to see the next session. Good day. My name is Ricardo Garcia. I'm the Director of Accessibility and Digital Inclusion at ATOS for the Iberian region. And I'd like to welcome you to this session that is part of the Zero Project Latin America Conference for 2022, where we will be talking about issues to do with innovation, accessibility, and how these innovative technologies can really improve the inclusion of people with disabilities. I'd like to talk, um, introduce myself. For, since the, last year, I've been working with Atos in terms of uh, digital inclusion and accessibility. But since 2004, I've been working in this area of the inclusion of people with disabilities and accessibility and technologies, developing different projects in the United States, Latin America, and in Europe. I've been helping different governments, universities, organizations to really advance their strategies and policies in terms of digital inclusion. I also worked for several years in different Spain, organizations in Spain and in the United States at the George Institute of Technology. I've worked as a consultant for different organizations, both at the international level and with the United Nations. I've got a background in business from the University of Madrid, and I'm also certified uh, accessibility professional from the Institute of Accessibility Professionals. In this session, we're going to be talking about issues that are so interesting that are...
related to how new leading edge technologies can really facilitate the lives of people with disabilities. But we also think have to think about the challenges that need to be overcome. How can we make sure that these technologies can really be rec replicable, scalable? How can they be converted into mass technologies that can be used by different populations and that can help solve all of these issues? We have to think about all the problems that they're going to face in doing so. Who can market them? Who can scale them? Who can take them to market? Who is going to pay for these technologies? These are all questions that are very important to think about. And it's one of those things that I wanted to bring to the fore in this session. We're going to have three very interesting experts with us today who are bringing their knowledge into play in developing different innovations that are really so interesting and so important. We're going to have Pablo Escobar, who has a PhD in psychology, and he is with the Catholic University of Chile. And he's an assistant researcher at the Center for the Development of Inclusive Technologies, or CEDETI, at the same university. And he has been researching the cognitive processes that are related to reading and writing skills and how technology can help develop these skills. We also have Claudio Leverens, who is the co-founder and CEO of Munevo. And he's going to be presenting his initiative. He holds a degree in IT from the Technological University of Munich. And he also has a degree from Einspach. Then finally, we have Carlo Castellano, who also has a computer sciences degree from the University of Salerno. And he is with the Association of People with Reduced Mobility. And he has launched several different initiatives. He is the founder of Park for Dis, and he will be talking about the initiative. It is a platform that helps people with reduced mobility find parking spots. And he has also worked with other initiatives, such as Solnex. And he is the manager of a consulting company that also works for on initiatives for people with reduced mobility. And he works on developing different software that are targets these markets. So first, I would like to thank all of our panelists for participating today. And if we could begin with Pablo Escobar. Pablo is going to present La Misita, or Tiny Table, which is a really interesting project. It's a free application that supports the development of reading skills among children with a special focus on children with Down. So Pablo, please go ahead with your presentation and welcome to the session. Thank you, Ricardo, for that great presentation. We are so thankful for being here, joining you, sharing the work that we are doing with my colleagues and also with the other speakers. As Ricardo mentioned, I'm going to talk about La Mesita, the tiny table. It's a development that we created in Sedeti UC. We are a multidisciplinary team from the Catholic University in Chile, and we develop these technological solutions to improve the quality of life of people with barrier uh, access uh, barriers. We also have these tests that are more fair. We also have digital and analog games also related to research and also the development of software uh, focused in the empowering of development of learning of those children with educational needs. 
under this context, we find a very important problem, not only in Latin America, but also in other pla places in the world, which is the uh, reading and writing, uh, learning in children with Down syndrome. When we see this uh, reading skills profile, this profile is um, shows children with difficulties for understanding what they are reading and also the reading of pseudo words. This pseudo words in cognitive psychology are words that sound as if they existed, but they do not exist. But when we have to read this type of words, we have to use our phonological awareness in order to pronounce them. So it's this phonological awareness, the main uh, core that explains the development of reading, of the reading skills, and also it explains these difficulties. What happens is that although children have a good reading of different words, the reading of pseudo words and understanding is not very clear, creating a profile that is similar to other types of genetic syndromes, especially in those uh, children with typical development that present specific difficulties in reading comprehension that have a very similar uh, profile. So research has shown um, or showed in the 1990s that eventually the problem of reading for children with Down syndrome was very, was the important um, problem in the phonological aware or the awareness. And so what they created was like a bypass and not to force the phonological root in the reading uh, learning, but creating a different type of uh, reading methods. And these are global methods. And they did these changes. And although we had these changes, we continue to face this problem that children with difficulties in their development continue to see these low rates of reading learning process. The point is science progresses and especially in the study of reading skills and for more than 30 years those initial works realized that and we started to see that it's not that children with Down syndrome has this alteration in the phonological awareness. The problem was was in the pro, in the instruments that were not sensitive enough to identify this development. So research has shown us that for children with intellectual disabilities and children with other types of development conditions, they continue a different pattern in uh, different to the ones of the typical development. So those skills, technical skill, uh, uh, cognitive skills that are crucial for learning to read in typical children, they are also applicable for those children with some type, type of di disability. So we created an alternative solution that is that passes through the technology and you understand that the technological model allows us to have a more more adaptability to the specific needs of these users where we can change the size of the fonts of the also the time involved in the stimuli of a screen and the way the texts are also presented and how we can navigate in these devices we also think that the technological solution is flexible as it adapts not only to the physical needs and cognitive needs and learning needs of these type of students, and it's an alternative based on evidence. This, the literature tells us that this works in order to support the reading learning process, not only for children with typical development, but also children with some type of specific difficulties in the learning process. That's when we developed this software that we called La Mesita or the Tiny Table. And this software is based on this cognitive model of reading in which we empower these four great uh, groups of skills that we understand are very important for children to learn to read. And this simulation of these paths is done through this virtual desktop or desk that is this co innovative component 
that is different to the um, traditional models of in the stimulation of reading skills that are based on models of trial and error, trial, error, trial, error. And they are also modified, but they continue the same pattern. We think, thought about this virtual desk in which users can deploy different worlds in which they are going to find words or vocabulary that is related to that world. It, let, let's say the park, the theater, the circus, the house, the market. And in these, they deploy these images that children can manipulate in according to their size. And also they can manipulate the writing of those words. And the system showed us some uh, preloaded words, but there is always the possibility to add new words and children or users can manipulate these words. So through this virtual desk, we stimulate these paths from phonological skills that are basic for the uh, learning of the reading process, the alphabet alphabetical uh, principle, which is the knowledge of the letters, and also vocabulary uh, uh, skills, uh, oral comprehension that we can also work through this software that offers the possibility of being very flexible and we can adapt these to the specific needs according to the context in which these children are learning. Also, this application has a user manual which also is calibrated or uh, considered according to the levels in the development of the skills. So parents, teachers can also stimulate these skills through this um, transparency, trans transference model of the teaching of the learning skills. We tested these, uh, the effective, effectiveness of this uh, um, tool, and we saw that Down syndrome children after the intervention uh, and the sustained intervention as base of La Mesita, they improved their uh, reading uh, learning, but also we found a another group of children who did not benefit from these uh, software, especially those who had uh, more uh, cognitive um, problems or disabilities. But the good results of the tool allow us to have a transfer in which what is good for the differential education is good for the rest of the world. And we could open this um, use of this uh, tool in the context of pandemic. It was widely used. They, there was this uh, word of mouth and people used it. Uh, we, re we got more um, downloads from the app because teachers asked parents to use this tool in order to stimulate the reading uh, skills in their children. The perspectives that we have with La Mesita is to have other uh, languages versions. And also from the beginning, we want to be able to have less, or, I mean, the less changes as possible. So we can have our tool in other languages. We have uh, the version in English that we call Tiny Table. And also we had the transfer of this uh, virtual desk for learning maths through a software that we also created that, that is called Racking. And also we want to create another app that is more basic for those children with greater uh, disabilities. And that for the abilities of early communication can be stimulated through this software, this type of software. Also, we want to remind you that these apps are free. They are for Android and iOS um, systems, and you may download them as well. Thank you so much for this invitation. Thank you very much, Pablo. Congratulations on the project. It's really an excellent presentation and it's such an interesting project. And I think it has so many possibilities to be able to scale it up and to extend it into different languages. I think you're working on it in a really interesting and the correct way. And I think there are so many possibilities to be explored. Uh, and using this technology so that more people, more children can really take advantage. Now we're going to go to our next guest, Claudio 
Leverence. He's going to be speaking to us about Munevo. It's a technology that is based on using smart glasses that allow the user in a wheelchair to be able to uh, move about using their head. And so it's really for those users who don't have the ability to be able to physically manipulate their chair, it gives them a really interesting alternative to manage the functioning of their chair. Claudio, welcome, and please go ahead. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Ricardo, for the introduction. Uh, I'm super happy to be here, and I'm going to talk about uh, Munevo and assistive technology based on smart glasses. Just as a short introduction, who are we? Uh, here I have a picture of Alika. Alika is our youngest user. She's eight years old. She's sitting here in the middle uh, on her wheelchair, and left and right to her are my colleagues uh, and also my co-founder, uh, Konstantin, and it's based basically showing their smiles and it's basically showing like what, why we are doing what we're doing. Um, it's in order to help people and create those smiles on their faces. Munevo was founded in 2018 and Munevo Drive is the first power wheelchair alternative drive system that is using smart glasses. I'll tell you more how it works in a second. But as of now, we're, uh, we're a startup. So uh, nevertheless, we equip more than 150 wheelchair users with the solution and all were 100% reimbursed. Why? Because it's a medical device and it went to all the regulatory hurdles. Uh, we also got our FDA approval now in December 2021. So we're currently also expanding to the US and soon hopefully also to Latin America. Uh, we're, we're very proud also of our team. So we're about um, 20 people already now with people from academia, clinic, rehabilitation, but actually also wheelchair users have joined our team, which makes us also really proud. And right now we're still looking also for contacts in the rehabilitation space, insurance payers, clients and distributors. So happy to connect after the presentation as well. You heard it already maybe in the beginning. So these are the current solutions that people have to use when they are in a wheelchair and when they cannot use their joystick control with their own hands. So what happens is that the, the, the joystick of the wheelchair is positioned somewhere in front of the chin, and then people have to push with their chin against the joystick to drive a wheelchair. And then there are different other alternatives, such as buttons, where you push against the buttons. And here in the picture, you see that there are a lot of devices in front of the face, which makes it very stigmatizing, which makes it also very hard to adapt because it's very static and mechanical, meaning that as soon as you change position in a wheelchair, and that happens on a daily basis throughout the day, then those solutions are somewhere in the eye or on the nose, and it doesn't really work anymore. So we really have to rely on a lot of support of rehabilitation experts or distributors that come and have to fix it, or some people are trying to push it, and often it breaks. And Monibo Drive is the first digital solution. The smart glass itself has um, movement sensors integrated, and through those movement sensors, we use actually the same movement as you would use with your chin control or with the buttons, where you push against the button and your head is moving. So we use the same movement. The benefit of the solution, I'll go with that in a second, is that it actually can be calibrated. The signals that we take from the sensor data, we send to an adapter that we can connect to any standard power wheelchair. And after that, the smart task comes with a lot of features integrated. So we have have a camera, we have a microphone, we have a display, and there's also an audio system. So by that, we show the user information and he also or she also hears the information read out loud. And that is very important also for people that have cognitive impairments to really understand how to use the solution. So the advantages are pretty clear. I mentioned the calibration. This is something that is done by the user, him or herself. It takes 15 seconds. So whatever like uh, whatever time of the day, whatever position, he or she can always adapt it to his or her needs. It's also more comfortable because you don't have anything around your face anymore. And through those integrated functions, we can connect it also to other, other devices. So it's very intuitive. But there's not just benefits for the user. Actually, we thought and we developed this together with therapists, with rehab specialists, and the users in mind. 
It's a plug and play system because it takes us only five minutes to plug it into the wheelchair. And we offer a lot of support from far because as soon as we install the solution, at home we can connect it to the local Wi-Fi and by that get access to remote uh, maintenance, meaning that we can update the solution from far, we can fix things from far, and it's completely digital. So there are no mechanical repairs in the end compared to the other solutions that often fail or break down and have to be replaced. And we even thought one step further. <clears throat> as soon as we developed Monevo Drive, we found out that it's not just about the wheelchair. It's also about the whole environment of the user. So we connected the solution to their phones, so people can also make phone calls right now or control their phone. We connect it to the computer so that they can use it as a computer mouse. And the latest technology or latest feature was to connect it to the home environments, so the smart home systems, meaning that you can connect it to your TV and turn you know, the TV on and off, switch the channels. You can connect it to the lights and turn on the lights, open the door, open the blinds. So a range of possibilities for the user to enhance their everyday life. And we don't want to stop there. So we're still continuing to develop multiple things. The latest or newest feature that will be released soon is also an offline speech recognition that we'll also want to train to also help people that have speech impairments, um, but that would make it overall easier to connect to the different solutions and have a faster access to these features. If you want to get in touch, here's our contact details. I would like to say that we are very, very much looking forward to also connect to everyone in Latin America. I think it's an amazing opportunity for us. We know that we can help a lot of people and we would like your support. So please, as mentioned before, get in touch with us and we'll be happy to connect and to discuss different possibilities, what we can do in order to help more people become more independent. And, and that's my last slide. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Claudio. What a fantastic presentation. And it's a technology, a solution that really solves people, like problems that people really have. And that's what we're trying to do here, is to try and solve those day-to-day -day problems. It's just a fantastic solution. I really hope that everything goes really well for you, and I wish you all the success. And we'll go on to our third guest today, Carlo Castellano. He's going to be telling us about his application, Park for Dis, which, as I said, it solves those real life day-to-day -day problems. Uh, here, it's for people with reduced mobility. And so, Carlo, if you can just tell me, uh, let me say this. I was really interested to see that one of the rally pilots, Albert Ureda, he uses wheelchair and he has competed in rallies his entire life. But he says, then when he gets in his own car and he tries to find a parking spot, he cannot find one. And so it doesn't matter. He often finds someone who doesn't have a disability card in his spot. So I think Park for Dis is uh, something that could solve his par problem. Carno, go ahead. Welcome. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much, Ricardo, for the introduction. Albert Ivera is a friend of mine, in fact, and he has participated in this project. I, I want to give you a little bit of context. My name is Carlo Castellano. I'm in my mid-50s, white, I use a beard and eyeglasses. And today I'm going to be talking about the Park for Dis project. It is based on one of the initiatives of ASOPMR, which is the Association of People with Reduced Mobility in Spain. I'll show you a little bit about our team and how we founded our initiative. 
we want to gather and distribute all that information about accessibility for people with reduced mobility, because this is really a personal issue as well. I saw that there was a lack of information about the certain issues, the primary one being that where are parking spots for people with reduced mobility located? We know where they are, and but even if we find out that information, we find that the spot is actually full. Do, can we figure out where the other spots are available? So, in the European Union, we have municipal ordinances that manage all of these spots for people with reduced mobility. And so we wanted to figure out how we could manage all this information. It was something that I thought of because of my own personal situation, but it's a situation that is shared with more than 15 million people throughout Europe. And so there were a series of local initiatives that tried to manage all of this information on different uh, reduced mobility parking spots. But we saw as a group that, think about it, in Spain, there are more than 8,000 localities. And if you wanted to travel and you needed to have to download each one of these applications and all of that information, you would need one for every single city that you're traveling to. And so we saw that there was a need to create a central platform. And we're looking to expand it throughout Europe. And it's become this Europe-wide intercity solution that shows the user in an interactive manner where they can both receive and contribute information about where those parking spots are available. We've divided it into two areas. We've got Park for Just People, which is an app and a web platform that is free for users. And first, it provides all of that information, where the places are, what are the local rules for parking. Then it allows me to know, in this city, where can I park? Is it a loading zone, etc.? And I've often found, when I go to park in a place that I'm not very familiar with, that I've come back and I've got a fine because I wasn't aware of those local ordinances. So, you know, it can be such a nightmare. So we decide to incorporate that information. So we decide to guide people to those places. Then we can also allow our users to report information, for example, to the municipality. If they have found that, for instance, it's being occupied by someone else. And the technology also allows them to be able to reserve certain places, certain spots. We found that there was a need for the different municipalities to be able to manage all of these problems in order to improve the user experiences, to be able to update all of the spots that were being made available, and to be able to provide the information on the fraudulent use of the disability cards that are available in Europe. For example, those people who might borrow their grandparents' card to be able to go and park near the beach, etc. We want to be able to have that information and gather it together. And so we've been able to invest in order to continue to add more and more features to our platform. We've been able to bring together a lot of different statistics. And now we are seeing that we are reaching more than 5,000 users now. We've incorporated more countries in Europe. We have more than 250 mayoral officials that are working with us and many volunteers who are helping us to map where all of this information on parking spots are available. We've been featured in several different media. And we've also had the backing of the Fundación ONCE. And we're working with several different organizations here in Spain. And we've also been awarded or recognized by different uh, organizations such as Zero Project. And we've also received some international attention. 
we finance the initiative through providing consultancy services and raising awareness on the different issues. So we work from an end to end with all the different actors and we help to provide consultancy on the regulation as well of these parking spaces. We also sell annual subscriptions for our IT solutions. And so where, what we want to do in the future is to include voice command. And we also want to provide more information so that we can see in real time the availability, not just of on-street par uh, parking, but also the private off-street parking that might be available to people with reduced mobility. We also want to increase, of course, the number of beneficiaries and continue to expand our presence throughout all of the European countries. And I want to leave you with sort of a final thought one of the things that we're looking to do is to make that paradigm shift from being a smart city, which we find a bit obsolete, to becoming a smart human city, where the person is the focus rather than the city. Because why should the user also have to have all be the one that provides the information? They should be the focus of receiving all of that information. I leave you here with my contact details if you'd like to learn anything more about the project. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all the speakers. And now we are going to start with the panel and the Q&A session. We are going to start with Pablo. I had some very specific questions for you. The first question, do you think it's possible to replicate that learning methodology of La Mesita to the teaching of a specific knowledge such as financial education or but for Down syndrome adults. And the second question is, how can we bring this technology to different educational systems around the world, considering the different cultural particularities, uh, social and cultural context, family context, the availability of support uh, systems for children? How do you think or how do you see this in terms of a possibility to expand these to other countries with different characteristics? Thank you so much, Ricardo. About the first one, it's not, it's, we have to consider replicating this to work with people who are older. We have been focused in children mainly. And this part of, uh, we have to think that now they are children and in the future they will be adults and they will have to continue with a type of a special support and mainly these supports that will allow them to be more independent and a better quality of life. So the idea of creating a replica or a, a copy for people who are older, uh, we've been thinking about that oh, because we want to accompany them in their transition to an adult life. And also we have been developing other support strategies, not only through La Mesita and also the virtual desk, but also we consider the difficulties adults have to access people, the information barrier uh, from the limitations in the development of the reading process and also the work with easy uh, texts or easy readings. This adaptation is something that we also are doing in Latin America with the methodology of easy reading. And Something that we have also worked is the multimodality. You only have 30 seconds for the writing part. The multimodality is something that we can empower, we can use to empower the access to information. When we think about replicating these in other contexts and in other countries, first we have to have a very flexible tool that will allow you to change contents so they are 
uh, more adequate in uh, social and cultural terms. And also we can think of offline elements. And not only that we use the app, but we can accompany them with the methodology. Thank you, Pablo. That was uh, great. Thank you for the time, for the limited amount of time that we have. I think you have summarized everything well. We are going para las siguientes preguntas. to continue with next questions for Claudio in this case. Claudio, I wanted to ask you this. You have, first, do you have a special programs for people with low income people or scarce resources? They may have access to Muniva Drive. And the second question is, do you think it's possible in a sustainable way to provide this augmented reality in your system in order to improve this user experience? And if so, do you think this would be a first situation of accessibility as an example of accessibility for the metaverse? Thank you very much, Ricardo, for those questions, especially the last one. I'll, I'll try to keep it short, but um, let's start with the first one. So. We already managed to get the solution integrated into different healthcare systems. Um, that should be around about seven countries right now in Europe that already are uh, available to get 100% reimbursed. And that is also always our goal. So we always try to work together with the healthcare insurances or the different like uh, systems that allow this to be reimbursed. Um, and then also trying to like bring together like um, yeah, looking at, you know, developing countries as well to see how we can, like, integrate it as there, which is a bit more challenging, I have to say. So this is something that we hope that also with the time, the healthcare systems will also evolve more and also our solutions will become cheaper at some point so that it will be much more affordable for, for people uh, with low income. Um, now maybe to the second question. So this is something very interesting. Um, our solution right now is not using the AR principles. We did test with, you know, uh, AR glasses. Um, the challenge there was always that we need to also look at the comfortability of the user. So our users are wearing the glasses day in, day out. So it has to be very light. And those, um, yeah, AR glasses right now are, are not very light. They're a bit uh, heavy. But I'm sure that also this technology will evolve and it will become more easy to use and so on. And then I think, yes, we would love to be there at the forefront um, because I think if we develop something um, such as, you know, metaverse technologies and, and things like that, we should always develop it also with people in mind that oftentimes get overlooked when it comes to these technologies. So uh, we would love to, to be there. Um, they are wanna... very certain from my point of view. We are <clears throat> going to talk to uh, or start with Carlo with the last questions. Carlo, have you considered in spreading the model of Park for This to other regions such as Latin America, Africa, Asia, and etc.? Sorry. And Considering these, do you think the cultural differences, the social differences may facilitate or stop the this implantation or these uh, trying to uh, install Park for This in these regions? It's an excellent question. About the first question, I can tell you that Park for This is created due to our European recommendation from 1998, in which they took different decisions. And the first one was to standardize the European card. And in second place, the fact of allowing all disabled people of the 28 member states in the past, now 27, because the UK is no longer part of the European Union, of allocating a number of spots that are reserved and they may park in any place where they wouldn't interrupt the cir circulation. But that's a basic concept that first was a unified card, and it makes that the nature of this part for this project is a European project. Having said that, 
Of course, we are in contact with uh, countries such as Chile in order to study the implementation of these guidelines in other countries. This would be a study from the association that has this knowledge. We have to do this gap analysis in order to understand how to implement this because the basic concepts are the same. The card, uh, whether it, it's, uh, it's a uh, European standard, we have to comply this with this uh, format and the fraud with the card when another person uses that. We have a special tinted a uh, solution for these and we may export these to other countries. Second, this is a very interesting question, of course, there are differences and there are differences in other continents, but also in the same European continent, there are a lot of cultural differences, for example, between a Nordic and a Latin country. And it, you would be surprised that to hear that in Spain, where we started, there is a great difference between towns and also we have divided them into a small, medium and big cities continuing the or following the standard of the uh, Statistics uh, Institute of Spain. It's different to have an urban city and a tourist destination. They have different connotations, but we have detected those differences between the models and an African country, an Asian country, a European country. Also, they have different connotations or differences. And I'm not concerned about technology. As you mentioned, it's more about the awareness, the consciousness of how to um, involve people, how to talk to people. They involve the actors that are private and public. That would be a very interesting work. Excellent. Thank you, Carlos. And while you were talking about this, I was thinking on the possible synergies that we could have. And when we talk about the augmented reality between your app and what Claudio has been doing in this case, because the target is quite similar. It can be the same in many cases when identifying where the places or the spots are, the in context information to improve the user experience. Thank you so much for the answers to my questions. I think they give us a lot of information, valuable information, very interesting for the audience. And now that we're going to close this session, this panel, before we finish, before we go home, I wanted to ask you if you could offer the audience a reflection, a very short reflection, an idea in just a few words that you want the audience to keep in their mind, something that is relevant that you want as a summary, very brief. We're going to start first with Pablo. Pablo, I would say that when we develop all this work that we've been doing, it has to be focused on the rights and mainly on justice with people. I think that's a great contribution that we can do from our uh, fields, justice and rights. Thank you so much, Pablo. I think that is a very good reflection, very important reflection. Claudio. Thank you very much for all the, the questions and the, the answers. Also, it's really interesting. And I think mine would be more a call to action. Uh, I think I would say that let's try to develop and design more inclusively and um, take into account every every person. Because in the end, we've seen now how it can not only benefit these persons, but the greater like communities and all of humanity in the end. So that would be my uh, call to action to everyone. Thank you so much, Claudio. That was excellent. And now, Carlo, I have two reflections. Yes, I'll give, I'll share with you my reflection too at the end. Of course. 
first reflection. It's something that I've talked uh, already, which is the concept of a smart city, because a smart city and in a smart um, tourist destination is used, but that's not inclusive if they are not totally accessible. For me, it's very important. We have to consider the user, not the city, and that has to be transversal. And also something that I use in the in the signature of my emails and very good translation. I think that's my phrase, that's my sentence, and that can be applied to any type of disability, but also for the elderly and other groups of people. Thank you so much. I think I wanted to contribute with a last reflection using what we usually, we usually say, nothing for us without us, with, which means that for the development, for the design of all these apps, of all these technologies, that are going to try to improve the quality of life of people with disability, and then they also improve the quality of life of much more people. But the quality of life, the experience of people with disabilities, elderly people, they are always, we always have to include these people in the design from the design phase. We have to incorporate that knowledge of the people we have to incorporate or include their opinions, their needs, their complaints, the problems they experience at the moment of designing these solutions. So we do not have to design something and then change it, or we have to fix it later because we haven't included the needs and the preferences of the audience. This is addressed. So, to summarize this very briefly, we have seen this app that Paulo has shown us mainly addressed for children with reading comprehension uh, problems, especially for Down syndrome children that have demonstrated they can improve their capacity for reading. And also we have seen a very innovative technology from Claudius team for people with reduced mobility based on the movement of the head that help people that have very, very reduced uh, movement in their hands so they don't have to use a joystick when handling their um electrical wheelchair, and also we have seen an app that Carlo has uh, presented in order to facilitate the experience of finding a parking spot and booking that for people with reduced mobility in urban areas that we know it's something that we have seen. It's something that we see on a daily basis that need a solution. And now we see the how useful these uh, apps are or these solutions are in order to solve daily life problems. And now we have to consider how to scale these in different parts of the world, in different contexts. So a lot of people can use and receive a benefit of these type of applications. Now we are going to finish our panel. We want to thank the Scubreme Foundation and Zero Project. It's been a pleasure for me to moderate this panel. It's been a great learning experience. And we want you all to continue in the next with the next panel or the next edition of Zero Project. And all my regards to you.